last week we were looking at uh, change. And uh, we've seen so far so many types of change. Some could be aggressive. Some could be gradual. Some could be mild. Uh, change even includes, you know, closing down your activity completely. Because if your activity started on the wrong foot, then definitely you can tell what the end will look like. And shutting down operation is not supposed to be perceived as failure. I've had businesses in the past that never went. I mean, businesses I sank so much money into that failed. But I don't call it failure because I look at it as one more way of learning how not to do business. And sometimes learning how not to do a thing could be costly, but then it is worth all the experience. And it is the reason Bible says that all things, including what the world calls failure, all things work together for your good. And so I trust that some of these experiences God gives to us so that through those experiences, you and I can learn vital tools, vital information, and things that are key for we moving forward with the things God has called us to do. And so uh, today I have something important to share with you in this series of studies. And as always, I want to wrap up uh, the concluding part of last week, because that is definitely going to help us zoom okay. into uh, what we are discussing you know, uh, today. So I'm just going to bring the last concluding conversation we had last week. And um, we spoke pretty much about indicators. Indicators point you to the fact that it is time for you to implement a change of some degree to what you are doing. And uh, of course, if you used to have a good turnover and now that turnover comes to a screeching halt, uh, we concluded that it is time for you to do an internal audit, figure out what is causing you to bleed, what is causing you to lose money. Or if it's ministry, what is causing you to lose members? What is going on? It will be a terrible thing as a leader for you to experience loss, and just sleep over it and do nothing about it. You got to find out what is causing that. Your turnover is gone down. Your ministry, your turnover is in the uh, the lives you are impacting. And of course, if there are no lives to impact, there is no ministry. And so if these lives, you are experiencing a high turnover. And of course, even in ministry, not only do you have people you are impacting directly, there are also people that are working along with you in the ministry. And if you are losing all these key people, you are losing key members, you are losing even ordinary members, it is important for you to seek the face of God, sit down with your leadership, figure out what is going on, what is making us lose membership, what is making us lose our key leaders. And it is the same with business. Uh, you got to do an internal audit. Last week, we spoke about SWOT analysis which is acronym for strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat. At every given point in time, every organization needs to analyze, audit, take a critical look of what your strength is. Are you staying true to your strength? Are you uh, recognizing your weaknesses? Paul said, I would rejoice in my weakness. There is nothing perfect in this realm. You know, last week when I was, preaching the, the, the Spirit inspired me to make a statement that in God's garden of grace, every broken tree bears fruit, and we are all broken. So uh, there is weakness in everybody. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is 100%. That is why you need me, and that is why I need you. God never made any of us to be self-sufficient. There is always something lacking in us. So you must examine your weakness. And even those weaknesses can be used as uh, a great tool for reaching out, for expansion, for doing all the great things God has called you to do. So weakness must not even be perceived as a negative thing. And then, of course, there are always opportunities in major markets. I I'm just, you know, considering our next course being around, you know, the current trend of the virtual world. And metaverse, a lot of people are still struggling to embrace it when Bible thousands of years already prophesied about it, that in the last days, 
knowledge shall abound. And a lot of people are quick to give credit to the devil for all the various degrees of knowledge we are having in our world today. The devil has no bone of invention. I've always said that. The best he could do is to pervert that which God creates. God is the ultimate creator. In fact, he's the one that created the devil. And so if God created all things, why give credit to the devil? I can imagine the days of cell phone, the days of television. The original purpose of television was to tell a vision. But of course, the devil perverted that and used it for his own agenda. In fact, Bible calls the devil the prince of the air. So when you talk about the airway, you talk about media, he's the guy that is in charge. And so, of course, if we give him the opportunity, he's going to engage the airwaves, call it social media, call it television, call it radio, call it internet, call it metaverse. All these new things that are happening, if we give him the opportunity, he's definitely going to engage it. But God gave us all these tools so that you and I will use it. It was just to open us up to the future that was to come when the centurion met Jesus and said, don't come home, give me virtual ministry. Pray for my child who is at home and he will be healed. And that was virtual ministry. Today, a lot of people believe that, you know, anything virtual is of the devil. No, the devil can't have that. It is God's own way of fulfilling the scripture that says that the gospel will be preached to the ends of the world then the end will come. Please understand your Bible that this gospel is going to go to the ends of the world, not the way Paul did it, sitting on a horse and traveling from place to place, not like John Wesley and Charles Wesley did, riding on horses to bring revival to communities. Now, you could be sitting where I sit right now and be ministering to people in Ghana. We have Pastor David here uh, from New Jersey, we have Brother Michael in Ghana. We have the Dodos in Texas all tuning through the power of social media. And you think the word of God is not going forward? It is going forward to the ends of the world. So why give the credit to the devil? What we need is knowledge, how we can use this new development to expand the kingdom. But unfortunately, anything we don't understand is the devil. You know, many years ago, Back in our time, we had what we call sixth form when you are done with high school in, in Ghana, where I come from. And um, I took a course. The course was called African Traditional Religion. And one of the topics that we discussed in that course was witchcraft. And <laughs> one of the interesting ways back in the days they teach in Africa is that they will introduce the course give you the characteristics of whatever is being discussed, then you go right into advantages and disadvantages. And then I was waiting to look at the advantages of witchcraft. And the teacher goes, and this is a statement, the benefit of witchcraft is to explain the unexplicable. So anything in the African setting we can understand and we can explain, it is witches. And that was the benefit of witchcraft. That anything that we cannot explain, inexplicable, it is witchcraft. It is no different from what we see in our world today. Anything we don't understand, we don't have the knowledge on how to use it and effectively use it to engage, to be a blessing to people, we quickly say this is the devil. No, it can't be the devil. Television can't be the devil. TBN, WebNet, all these beautiful channels are communicating. I used to belong to a church that uh, started off in Nigeria, one of the powerful churches in the world today. And uh, they are big thing is on holiness. They emphasize so much on holiness. I tell you, those days I could go into services and feel the literal presence of God because of the purity of the hearts of the people. And one of the things they preach against in those days, and this was in the early 80s, they preach that it is a sin for a believer to watch television. And I was like, wow. And we bought into it. Uh, you know, my parents took their TVs. They, they threw it away. They gave it up. We, the only TV we have, by the way, was black and white. And I'm just wondering. Today, that same church, the founder preaches on television. That is just to let you know that even with business models, 
we need to transition. And today I'm going to show you how even God, who is perfect, who is all-knowing, transitions. We see that in the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Bible specifically says that if there was no fault with the original covenant, then there wouldn't have been a need for a new one. That is change of model. And we're going to learn some stuff in the word. So if you're a pastor listening to me, don't feel embarrassed changing some of the things you told your members five years ago. And don't be afraid to change because they're going to question you that you said five years ago, God told you to do that. And now you are saying we should do this. And because of that, you are stuck in a rut and the church cannot move forward. The ministry cannot advance. No, you must break away. If God is speaking to you and you are receiving knowledge that it is time to bring change, don't be embarrassed. Be confident. Be bold about it. And move on. All right. So uh, the other thing we spoke about is revolving door. It's, it's important. Whatever you are doing to pay attention, not just to the front door, but even the back door. Because a lot of people might be entering through the front door and exiting through the back door and not coming back again. And you must question what is going on. If your business starts turning into a revolving door where team members are coming and going, something needs to change. It might be the same with your church, your ministry, your organization, your business. There could be a moral issue. I mean, a moral issue. It could be people are not motivated. Uh, similar companies with more competitive conversations might be attracting people from your organization or people with better packaging and what they do in their church or ministry are attracting people from your ministry. But if you start seeing a pattern, be sure to pay attention to feedback and have a comprehensive exit interview. I spoke about that. When people are leaving, talk to them in the spirit of love. Even though they are leaving, find out why are they leaving? It is called exit interview. And like I shared with you last week, people will walk to me in my ministry and say, we want to leave. We want to move on. I sit down with them and have a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation. I want to find out why are they moving? And I would tell you for the most part, they would never tell you the truth, but it's good to have that conversation. And a good thing is that sometimes after they leave, you get to know the real reason why they left. And when you get to know, do something with that information. Don't ignore it. Don't be quick to say the devil is using them. There might be some good stuff that you need to learn from. And so don't conclude, you know, I've always said that if the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, everything will be seen as a nail because that is the only tool you have. So if you conclude that every decision of your members, of people that are in your team, people that patronize your staff are turning against you and it is because of the devil, you are missing the point. All right, so revolving door is a key thing we got to pay attention to if we want to continue to grow in the things we have been called to do. Indicators of change, it is key. All right, today is week five, and we're going to go right into why business model must change. And a lot of us fight change. Anytime you sit at the back of a car, and a car is moving at a certain pace, your body stays in a certain position. The moment the driver applies the brake, your body jacks forward. The reason why your body jacks forward is because your body, just like the car, has been in this forward movement all along. But the moment the driver applies the brake, your body still wants to continue in that motion. It doesn't want the sudden stoppage. And I know Brother Dodo did engineering. He knows this principle in science. <laughs> Praise God. In that same way, if you were sitting in a car and a car suddenly took off, your body goes back in that motion because it wants to remain in that position. What I'm just trying to say is that humanly, we are wired to resist change. We don't want anything different from what we've been doing. But then change is necessary. 
And I wanted to think about God. God is perfect. God is all knowing. God knows everything before it happens. But we're going to see in the uh, movement of God that God keeps changing the way he does things. There was a time he asked Moses to build him a tabernacle. He transitioned from a tabernacle when he encountered Solomon and he asked him to build him a temple. But even in the book of Acts chapter 10, he makes very clear, I am tired. I'm no longer going to live in temples built with the hands of men. I would dwell among them. And that is what Isaiah prophesied many years before the change comes. He says, behold, I do a new thing. The former things I do no more. Behold, it springs forth. So God is always doing new things. And then if God is our ultimate model, example, mentor, then we must learn from him. That even God who is all-knowing, who is never wrong, he can be wrong. He's never been wrong. He keeps changing. How much more you and I in this realm that has a lot of brokenness. So here we go. Entrepreneurs often struggle with trying to understand the concept of business model, which may seem abstract and in some cases technical. It can be simplified down to two basic components. How the business, how the church, how the organization plans to generate sales. And of course, if you are a church, your goal is not to generate sales, but to generate membership that will come in to be impacted by your product, which is the word of God. How the business organization plans to generate sales is key. How to generate committed members is key. And how the company plans to generate sales revenue and the operational factors that would enable it to reach and maintain profitability. That is what entrepreneurs, that is what pastors, that is what business owners, sole proprietors, uh, investors in a business, that is what they are looking out to. And so the question then is, how do we model this change? How would this business model change cause us to have this desired result? Now, as the organization proceeds from the startup stage, the model often changes due to a few factors I want to share with you. That is why you can't have your model written in a stone that we cannot change it. Whether it's a church, whether you're a pastor, whether it's a not-for-profit, whether it's a business, a restaurant, whatever it is, you can't afford to have your model inscribed in a stone and say, we cannot change. And that same spirit must be in the spirit of your team, your members, because sometimes when you are trying to change, because something in the church has changed, the old members will begin to fight it. They are the frugal sons who have been with you all this while. Now the prodigal son has come home and they are fighting because they can't understand the newness, the place you are taking this vision to. But you must stand and you must train them and explain to them and reveal to them where you are going. You are the vision bearer. It's only in Africa that we lead the sheep from the back. I was a shepherd when I was a young kid and I never led the sheep from the front. It was always behind with a stick, with a stone, with screaming, and you get a goat and a sheep moving. But it wasn't until I grew and I began to understand how real shepherding in Israel and in other places of Asia happened. Shepherds never lead from behind. They lead from the front. And leaders must never lead from behind. You lead from the front. You're a pastor. Don't lead from the shadows lead clearly from the front. I tell you, when it is time for the sheep to go back home into their pen, the shepherd has various sound and noise it will make. It could be as simple as... And the sheep knows the meaning of that sound that the shepherd is making, and they begin to follow. It is time for us to go home. You don't have to scream on them. You don't have to shout on them. There are gestures the shepherd will make, and the sheep will follow. But that is what true shepherds and leaders must do, leading from the front. 
because we understand that we can never take anybody to a place where we are not willing to go. You cannot take anybody to a place you yourself has never gone before. You read a book of Psalm 23, he leaded me beside the still waters. How do you lead me there when you don't know the place? He already knows the place. He brings me to a greener pasture because the day prior, whilst me as a sheep was sleeping, he went scouting and looking for a place he will bring me in the morning. But that is what leaders are supposed to do. They know where they are taking the sheep. You are not guessing. You know exactly where you are taking the organization. You know where you are taking the ministry. You know where you are taking a business to. You dream it, you leave it, you speak it, you declare it because you have taken a quality time to analyze and assess your situation as an organization. So again, as the organization proceeds from the startup stage, the model often changes due to one, new opportunities are going to come. Opportunities that didn't exist when we began. Now there is a big marketplace on social media. You're like, no, our model, we're never going to sell on social media. You are missing out on a new opportunity. And that is the future. It is time for you to embrace 76% of people that use social media buy from virtual marketplace. Think about it. 76% and a good chunk of people. And I'm not talking about the millennials. I'm talking about baby boomers, people that were born, uh, you know, 50, 60 years. They are active on social media and they are buying on social media. So if you are stuck with brick and mortar, you are stuck with brick and mortar as a church, and that is all you can see with church, and anybody that doesn't come into brick and mortar is living in sin, you've missed it. God is creating a new platform, a new church. If God is even saying that a time is coming when a true worshiper shall worship God in truth and spirit, you must begin to see where church is going. And church must lead the way and not a business world. We must be the industry leaders. We must be the ministry leaders. We must be the people spearheading the new thing God is doing in the coming season. And so... One reason why you must begin to consider this change in your organization is because new opportunities are going to come. And not only that, new competitive threats. I tell you, people are going to come into the game that are going to do some crazy stuff. And if you are not prepared and ready for the competition, you're going to die a natural death. You could have all the anointing. Your ministry is going to die a natural death because you are not on the cutting edge. It is not just about prayer. God wants us to pray. It is not just about preaching. I, I told you several weeks ago that a lot of people make a decision to stick with a church. Within the first few minutes, they walk into the uh, church. When the message has not been preached, when praise and worship has not been uh, 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 engaged, they make a decision, oh, this is a beautiful place. I want to be part of this ministry. And sometimes they are decision because they are so carnal, they are not yet born again. They don't have uh, any contact with the spiritual for the spirit to impact them. Their decision is based on the physical things they are seeing. Oh man, the car park is beautiful. The ushers are well-dressed. I love the way they welcome it. That is all the reason why they made a decision to stay in the church. But that is what Bible says people would do. Men look at to the outward, but God look at to the inward. So the men who are coming into the church, who are not born again, have no relationship with the spirit, they're going to look to the outward, the physical things, the material things. So you cannot be all spiritually excellent and all the physical things ignore. Because when Queen Sheba came to Solomon's temple, he came to his palace. Bible says what got his attention was not a temple that God's presence filled that the ministers could not minister. None of that impacted it. What impacted it was the way his table was organized. Dinner was set. Men were serving at the table with excellence. Bible says when she saw all this, her first statement is that I've heard so much about you. But what I'm seeing here right now surpasses everything I've heard about you. And the Bible says her spirit left her. Think about it. Physical things has a way of impacting your spirit. 
He took the physical things to impact his spirit. So we cannot ignore the physical aspect of what we do as a spiritual organization. They are part of what we are called to do. And so new competitive threats are going to come against your organization, your business, whatever you are called to do. And what you do, the adjustments you make uh, in, in response to those competition would uh, reveal whether you're going to progress or die a natural death. And sometimes the reason why we need to make that change is simply because the business learns more about what its customers truly need. Because sometimes we start off and we don't even have an idea. We think we know, but we don't even know what our customers truly need. Hallelujah. I love this. And uh, sometimes also what we need to understand, one of the first tasks, now think about it when you started, or think about it for those of us that are now starting, one of the first tasks for a startup business is to design its business model. Many times this is done with limited knowledge. You think you know so much about the area you want to start up, but sometimes you wouldn't know how much of a lack of knowledge you have until two years down the road. And so many times this is done with limited knowledge of the market in which the company or business operates. A good number of pastors have picked churches in communities that they have no clue about the people that live in that community. You think you know, but you don't even know. You don't know the class of people. You have no idea the kind of flaws are in a community, whether it's a community that has many people uh, that are having kids out of wedlock, people that are on drugs, uh, people that are unemployed, or, uh, you know, you just don't have an idea of the community you are pitching your business. And the owner, the pastor, the management, and if it's a, a big corporation, may not even be certain that target customers will be willing to purchase the product or the service. You don't even know. The original business model may prove to be flawed and changes must be made to it for the company or organization to generate sales momentum. Change is so crucial and don't ignore change when it becomes inevitable or indispensable. Now, I want you to think about it and begin to look at why we need to change. And the reason why we need to effect change is because there are always defects of the original or initial model based on what we just read. Now, in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, and please understand this. I'm not taking anything away from God. God is perfect. He's sovereign. He's all-knowing. Nothing missing from him. Nothing disappearing from his presence. He knows all things. But look at what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 through 10. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Now, we have in a new covenant is a change. And the Bible says that the reason why that change was necessary, just like in our churches, in our ministry, there comes a time in our business where change must happen. But God found fault with the people and said, the problem wasn't God, of course, because there is no fault in God. He found a fault with the people. And he said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with the ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. Translation, there is going to come a time where your customers are going to change. And because of that change, it becomes necessary. I will give you a simple change. There are people that have made up their mind that they will never come into the church building again. They are happy with virtual church. Pastor, understand that. You cannot change that. And you cannot say because of that, they are not going to heaven. Hello? That is the reality. Now, why do we go to church? We go to church to receive the word. 
If they are in virtual, do they receive the word? Can I be honest with you? Sometimes they receive the word better than people who are in the church room who are texting with their friends. One of the reasons we go to church is to worship God. Are they able to worship God virtually? In the absence of the instrument and everything going on, that is why, Pastor, you cannot minimize the quality of the sound you are transmitting because they are connected, they are engaging with you virtually. There are people that are distracted, they are tuned off in the building who are not receiving. Can they fellowship? Because one of the reasons why Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as it is the manner of some. The reason is because God wants us to fellowship. When you look at the trend of metaverse, social media, one of the reasons why metaverse is growing the way it's growing is because I can be right where I am right now and I can have my entire office tune in. I can see my entire office on my screen, and I can tell one of my workers, go to that corner. You see that shelf? Show me that shelf. Video conferencing. And I will point him, this is the product I want you to take off the shelf. So I can have somebody like the Dodos in Texas, and after service, we can spend an hour just chatting. They can see me, I can see them, and we can chat. It is called fellowship. It's not in a building, but we are fellowshipping. People of God, let's have an open mind in the light of the word. Not open mind based on the world, the way the world wants us to have an open mind. It's a new season. It's a new day. Hello. It's a new day. We cannot fight the move of God, the new things God is doing. He says, behold, I do a new thing. The former things I do no more. What we need is knowledge on how to effectively use that which God is going to bring to us. And I tell you what, brick and mortar buildings are going to be there. We're going to have people coming into the building. But I tell you, there are people that are also happy being outside the building. And I tell you what, it's a blessing for them to be, a, to be outside the building because some of them will be a problem coming into the building. They just can't mix with people physically. They do better outside. <laughs> and they are effective. I'm training my virtual members to do virtual evangelism. They can have virtual flyers. Yeah, you know, engaging people virtually, witnessing to them virtually. During the COVID, like I said last week, I dedicated a child in North Carolina whilst I was in New York. I dedicated homes outside where I am. Are you telling me God won't hear such prayers? Of course. It's Jehovah omnipresent everywhere at the same time. Now look at what he says in verse 9. It will not be like the covenant I made with the ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turn away from them, declares the Lord. God says, I'm tired of the old. People pride. I love something this uh, man said, John Hagen. He says, if you invest all your money in buildings and structures and ignore the people, that kind of a church it's a fraud. There are pastors that pride themselves in the buildings they've built, not in the lives they've impacted. And so God will ignore those buildings and use virtual ministry to impact life because the goal is not a building. The goal is the lives of the people. Look at verse 10. This is the covenant I would establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That is where God is bringing us to. It gets exciting. We cannot place God in the same category, like I said, but we can surely learn all things from him. God's kingdom, unlike our business, never had a beginning because he 
has always existed. God is all-knowing, so we cannot put him in this category either. But these actions and statements provide a learning moment for you, for me, for us, even in our personal life, our business, our ministry, whatever God has called us to do. Yeah, we can learn a lot from the many progressive changes God has initiated. God believes in change. So we cannot be followers of God who fight change. Then we are not like God. Look at what Jesus says. And I love this. And again, I'm addressing the defect of the initial model you might have had as a pastor, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. You did that model, you wrote that model for your business initially because you didn't have enough information. But as knowledge comes, change must be effected. Look at what Jesus says here. A beautiful story here. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Please take note, he invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, keyword for any businessman is that you don't do broad spectrum. Doctors will give you a broad spectrum antibiotics when they are not sure about what is going on with you. But when they are very specific, they will give you a specific antibiotic that deals with your specific challenge. Now, in business, you don't do a broad spectrum marketing. You got to find your target market. What is my target market? What is God calling me to do as a church? Who are the people I'm supposed to minister to in a community? Am I called to drug addicts? Am I called to teenagers that are having babies? Am I called to the educated, the elite? Am I called to the unemployed? What am I called to? You got to figure it out, just like business. If you are called to minister to people who speak English, start speaking or uh, singing local songs, songs that are indigenous to Jamaicans. Start singing Patua song. Start singing Ghanaian or Nigerian song. If you truly claim that you are called to speak international or English language, stay true to it. Don't allow the pressure of the people to change your focus. In this example, Please understand, he sent the servants to go to anybody. No direction. He says in verse 16, he invited many guests. He was not specific. When you are not specific, your result is zero. And you can see none of them came. Everybody gave an excuse because you did not take time to do the research to figure out which people are going to like this banquet I'm setting up. And I'm going to invite those people that will be interested in this product, in this service, in this ministry. Who are the target people? You just went to the post office and tell the post office, I want to buy a mailing list. I want to send invitation to all people in this zip zone. One of the key things in my ministry is to target any young family that is moving into our area in Middletown. There are a lot of young families, young couples working groups of people because God is giving me a message that must bless people that have career, people that have profession, people that are thinking of establishing their own businesses. I believe God is giving me a message that speaks directly to them. So I must target such people. I must be like the fisherman who casts nets. It catches lobsters. It catches prawns. It catches shrimps. It catches uh, bronzini. It catches red snapper. It catches all kinds of fish. But I must be willing to throw all of them back into the sea and keep only the bronzini because I believe that is the market I have ready to buy. I'm not going to catch this fish and now go out there and look. Is there anybody here who is interested in lobster? 
I already did my research and I have customers that are waiting for Bronzini. So I am not going to engage in the distraction because guess what? Some of these fish are going to be rotten, stinking before I find a customer. In the meantime, I could have been back several times catching more of the Bronzini that I already have a market waiting for it. Focus is so key. Jesus said it. He says, a man with a single eye has great light. It is not having many eyes. Singleness of eye is key. There is an African proverb that if you try to look with your eyes into multiple bottles, your eyes will break. It has to deal with focus. What is that one thing you are called to do? You want to stay true to it. And in this example, as we can see, the master sent the servant to many people. In verse 60, it says, many guests, no direction. But look at the next thing. When he realized that his marketing strategy did not work, he changed. And that is where a lot of us struggle to change. When what you are doing is not working, what you do is to change. But look at what happens. When your strategy doesn't work, your face becomes like that man. <laughs> it's a defect. You become angry. Look at verse 21 of the same scripture. The servant came back and reported this to the master. The owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant. But that is what must happen to you when ministry is not going the way it's supposed to go. And please understand this. There is nothing wrong with anger. In fact, Bible tells you to get angry because anger is necessary. Bible says, be ye angry. He didn't say, do not be angry. He said, be ye angry but sin not. And then he goes on to say that, yes, be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. Jesus needed to be angry to whip the people out of the temple. Anger is necessary because it will push you to do the things you ought to do. And verse 21 says, the servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets, now look at it. Now he's specific. He didn't say go to many people. He says, I wanted to go to specific location. And I'm, I'm using this to really let you understand if you want to have results, you must be very specific of your location. You know, in business industry, we have what we call locating of industry. Uh, sometimes you see a cluster of hotels and there's a reason why they put all the hotels in one area. It's called localization of industry. And it, it's for a reason. And he says, go specifically now. <laughs> he, he's not very specific of his location. The owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets, into the alleys of the town and bring, now he's also specific, not just the location, but the kind of customers, the kind of people. He says, I want you to bring not the rich, the poor. Because this kind of food I'm cooking, it's only the poor that can afford. He says, those on Section 8, those on food stamp, those are our target. He says, bring the poor, bring the crippled, bring the blind, and bring the lame. Now, if God has called me and given me the healing ministry, these are the people I want to bring. If God is giving me the teaching ministry, I'm not going to have revival meetings hoping to heal people. I'm not called to that. So he says... I want you to go to a specific location now, and I want you to bring specific people. I love this. Now, verse 22 is key. And for me, that is a zinger. It says, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Take note. It means what you asked me to do has brought a lot of people. And even after bringing this lot of people, there is still room for growth. He says, it is time for us to now scale. It is time for us to now grow and do more because this strategy works and we need to move it to the next level. Look at 23. Then the master told the servant, this is the scaling strategy. We're going to move it up. Go out now to the roads. Again, being specific. When you are scaling, you still got to be specific. He says, go to the roads. Now go to the country lanes. And then look at what he says. He says, compel them. I love this. Now, the word compel is a Greek word, anakazo. And anakazo simply means 
force them. Now, another word for force is advertising. Do you realize sometimes how advertising make you buy things that you never intended to buy? <laughs> he says, compel them, anakazo them, force them. How can you force people? That is part of the model. When you go out there evangelizing, there are people you must be nice to, but there are people you have to force them. Bible talks about snatching them out of the fire because you can tell this guy is going to die in the next week. He's having cancer stage four and he has to receive Christ before he dies. Snatch them, compel them. Some of them you have to threaten them. Some of them you have to call them as it is, you brood of vipers. <laughs> The master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Whoa, pastor. Whoa, businessman. There is room to grow. God wants you to get to your full capacity. And so look at this. Target one, we see. General public. He sent them there. According to verse 16, there was no clear target market in the initial model. He bade many to come, Bible says, and they all came up with excuses. None of them participated in the product or service. Target number two, he changed the model because he saw a defect in the model. In verse 21, the CEO is upset. You need that to move on to do greater things. What happens when a business strategy doesn't work? He quickly, without any type of analysis. Now, that is key. Bible doesn't tell us whether he did any analysis, SWOT analysis to see what went wrong or audit what is going on. He designed another strategy or business model. And this time he had target. He said, go quickly. You don't sleep over it. When you know it is time for change, do it and do it quickly. I love Jesus. Even when that change hurts, he wants it to be done quickly. Time is of the essence. He looked at J Judas and he says, you, you want to betray me. You've collected money, so I will be killed. This is why I am here. What you have intended to do, do it quickly. Some of us are afraid to do and, and effect change, even though we know that change will bring us the desired result. He said, go quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. That was the target location. And bring the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. That was the target customers. You must have a target location, and you must have a target market. It's evident in this parable that when we don't target, we yield nothing. We cannot cater to every location and everybody. We must be very consistent and intentional once we have identified our location and group. It's also evident that defining location and target group will yield results. Target market number three, expansion and scaling. The verse he says, it is done and there is still room. Now he expands to the highways. He expands to the hedges. And now he compels them to come in. And like I said, compelling from the Greek word, anakazo means to force. And that has to do with advertising, marketing, social media, whatever you can engage to now begin to scale. What you are doing, that is beginning to work. You must take it to the next level. And... Uh, that is scaling. Now, I wanted to think about some of the changes you need to do. I'm going to start off and uh, wherever I get to, we will continue. I can't believe it. It's 10.03. <laughs> Time just flies when, you know, you get in something good. Now, I will talk about change in value proposition and that will continue next week. Now, value proposition describes the collective benefits your customers or your intended customers receive from using your service or your product. And it is so key. Now, the greater the value the customer perceives, the greater the chance he will choose to make a purchase. Companies don't always know what is important to their target customers. You can tell. You think that, well, the quality of the food might be what is most important to them. But sometimes that is not even what a customer is looking at. The customer is looking for a, a restaurant that would have quick 
uh, you know, to go orders and you are thinking the taste of the food is the big deal to the customer. They are looking for speed. And so sometimes you don't even know. You are thinking that is a music in a church now. The customers, the ch parishioners are looking for. And sometimes what they are looking for is a word that answers their nagging questions. It's key. And so change in value proposition is so crucial. A restaurant may start up with a value proposition of providing. That is your thought. And I use this example because I work in a restaurant industry. And you think that the lowest cost meal in your category, the type of food you do, might be what is of value to your customers. But then you soon learn that what is your customer's base it's not any of that, but what they are looking for is speedy service for takeout orders. Probably even at just noon time. We're looking for a restaurant at noon time. When we come out of the office, break time, we call within five minutes, lunch is in the office. The business model, when you recognize that, would then have to be changed to focus on improving the production efficiency of the kitchen and reducing their food preparation time. The meal prices under the new model could even go up. You were trying to reduce your price because you think, well, well, my price is low. Customers would love my product. And what they are looking for is not low price. They are looking for speed, somebody that would deliver the food quickly. And now when you find out that that is what the customers are actually looking for and you improve the efficiency, you can actually now even increase the, the price of your food and begin to make more. I'm talking about even the ministry. And again, there are things that can never change. How we get born again, we cannot compromise that. It is believing Jesus Christ. We can't say that people say, well, you know what? Uh, we want to be born again by our own standard. And so if we want to have the people, we're going to change that. There are things that are non-negotiable. If you're a man of God, you're in ministry, there are things that are non-negotiable. But there are things that are negotiable. They have nothing uh, in terms of impacting our salvation, our making it into eternity with the Lord. And yet we are holding on to it. God gave the children of Israel 10 commandments. And out of those 10 commandments, they created 417 different commandments. And all these 417 commandments were as simple as when you see your brother doing something that will make him break commandment number 17, number 10, make sure you do something about it so they don't do what they are doing so they break commandment number 10. So they began to create all this unnecessary craziness to safeguard the outbreaking of the Ten Commandments. But it doesn't mean that if I broke any of these 417 commandments, I have done anything negatively against God in the Ten Commandments. I'm saying this to say that we have created all this church dogma that has no basis on our faith. We have created all these things. I, I used to be in a church where the elders were fighting the people that it's a sin to come to church with an iPad or read a Bible on your cell phone. And the new generation, the millennials, they didn't want to carry the printed Bible. They wanted virtual Bible. They wanted digital Bible. And they were actually reading their Bible. They were not on Facebook. And the older folks were fighting them. And I'm telling you this, that value proposition is so key to what we are doing. And I hope what we have learned so far helps you to begin to effect change in your respective place. Some of you are just working in an organization and you need to bring some of this knowledge to the table. If you are not the ultimate decision maker, you got to bring it to the organization. If you think it's going to help that organization where you work to do more. God bless you, people of God. I'm done for today. I'm going to ask if there are any comments, questions, and uh, we will bring today's session to an end. We got three more to go. All right.